So now we will consolidate everything we've learnt so far by looking at some questions. And these are typical um, and reflective of those which may appear in the MRCP part one exam and possibly in part two as well. Which of these conditions is a small vessel vasculitis? So the options are Takayasu arteritis, giant cell arteritis, Kawasaki disease, granulomatosis with polyangitis and polyarteritis nodosa. So you will remember that um, from the Chapel Hill classification um, and the diagram which we discussed earlier that granulomatosis with polyangitis um, out of those five is the one which is a small vessel vasculitis. Which of the following is typically strongly positive or high in titer in a patient presenting with signs and symptoms concerning for PMR? So your options are ESR, creatinine kinase, ANCA, rheumatoid factor, or a creatinine. So the correct answer here, as you'll recall, is a high ESR. Don't be fooled into thinking that these patients have a high CK level. Um, this is not true. High CKs are seen in um, the inflammatory myopathies, which we've previously discussed. Second question, in a patient with confirmed diagnosis of PMR, which of the following medications is not usually required? Um, so your options are ibuprofen, Azcal D3, Alendronic Acid, Omeprazole and Prednisolone. And You'll remember that prednisolone is the mainstay of treatment and there are other medications that need to be given alongside that, given the long duration of treatment. And therefore, ibuprofen is the correct answer here. Patients should not typically require um, strong forms of pain relief in addition to their um, steroids, um, as the steroids should be settling the symptoms. If they don't, you need to be looking for um, a PMR mimic. This can include severe infections um, and malignancies, including a myeloma. Which of the following is not a typical feature seen in Kawasaki disease? Erythematous rash to the extremities, strawberry tongue, cracked lips, proximal arthralgia and cervical lymphadenopathy. Now, the question is asking which of these is not typical. So as we've seen, um, options one, two and three and five are classic features of Kawasaki disease. And while the patient may be in pain um, in their joints, um, inclu included, um, proximal arthralgia is not a typical or classic feature of Kawasaki disease. And therefore, the correct answer is number four. A 20-year-old lady brings her one-year-old son into hospital after noting a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius at home. This is confirmed in the emergency department. The child is found to have a strawberry tongue and cracked lips on inspection, which of the following is not a required investigation for this patient. So if you just think about how the patient has presented um, and what we would be suspecting, you're really suspecting that a, the patient is septic or B, that they've got Kawasaki disease and then there are more rarer differential diagnoses. So the options are blood cultures, chest x-ray, echocardiogram, bloods including a CRP and ESR and a lumbar puncture. Now again, all of these may be done at some stage um, depending on how the differential diagnosis progresses. But given that your top differential in this situation should be Kawasaki disease or potentially um, sepsis, the lumbar puncture is not the essential investigation here, but all of the others would be. Okay, let's do some questions. So we have a 70 year old gentleman presenting with a four week history of gradually worsening left sided headache. Over the last two days, he has noted blaring and gradual loss of color vision. On examination, you note a thickened appearance and texture of the frontal branch of the left temporal artery, which is exquisitely tender on examination. He's struggling to count numbers of fingers. What should be your initial treatment? The options that's been given is A, IV antibiotic, B, IV acyclovir, C, 60 milligram of oral prednisolone, D, 500 milligram of IV methylprednisolone, and E, metotrexate. So if you 
recall this case, you will realize that this is a classical de description of somebody who could potentially present you as GCA. You have got an elderly gentleman who is presenting with headache and visual and and visual problems, it would be really important for you to differentiate that because this gentleman is already unfortunately having visual signs and involvement, the, the um, appropriate choice of treatment would be hospital admission in order to be pulsed with IV methylprednisolone. Therefore, option D or choice four is the correct option in here. Question two is which of the following is true regarding GCA? One, a negative temporal artery biopsy exclude a diagnosis of GCA. Two, GCA is commonly diagnosed in people below the age of 50 years. Three, there is a poor cor correlation between levels of CRP and a diagnosis of GCA. Four, methotrexate may be considered as a steroid sparing agent for the treatment of GCA. And five, it is highly unlikely for GCA to present with constitutional symptoms. So let's go through these one by one. Option one is saying that a negative temporal artery biopsy exclude a diagnosis of GCA. As you recall, um, I mentioned earlier that although a temporal artery biopsy is technically the gold standard for diagnosis, one of the not too infrequently problems that we see on a daily basis is that these biopsy results are coming back as negative. And the reason is that if your um, um, surgeon or radiologist, depending on whoever does the biopsy, is not um, getting that exact point that has the inflammation around the artery, unfortunately, you're going to have what we call as a skip lesion. So you're not going to be seeing um, those um, classical um, histological GCA finding. Of course, this does not mean that the patient does not have GCA. And therefore, option one is incorrect. Two is GCA is commonly diagnosed in people below the age of 50. We did talk about this, that GCA is uh, commonly a disease of the elderly and is rarely seen in patients below the age of 50. So this is going to be incorrect. Three is there is a poor correlation between levels of CRP and diagnosis of GCA. You would remember um, that I mentioned both of your inflammatory markers, as in both CRP and ESR, are really quite important in diagnosis of GCA. And there is a, a good correlation between how active your GCA is uh, and how um, high your inflammatory markers are. Therefore, this option is going to be incorrect. Four is methotrexate may be considered as a steroid, as a steroid sparing agent for the treatment of GCA. Uh, we do know that this is correct and um, it is not too infrequently used in patients who have uh, struggle uh, with taking steroid uh, or have um, potential side effects of those. And finally is that it's highly unlikely for GCA to present with con uh, constitutional symptoms. And we know that this is incorrect um, given the fact that uh, it can present as a spectrum of polymyalgica rheumatica uh, or PMR um, and um, also other types of large vessel vasculitides. So having um, constitutional symptoms such as fever, weight loss or anorexia is not um, highly unlikely. Therefore, the correct option or the true statement is going to be option four. Okay, let's do some questions. Which of the following is uh, the preferred imaging modality to diagnose Takayasu arthritis? One, PET-CT. Two, CTA. 3 MRA for chest x-ray, 5 echocardiogram. And if you recall, uh, the preferred modality is in fact an MRA. Uh, however, a lot of the others such as PET-CT and CTA are very frequently used to help with the diagnosis of Takayasu arthritis. And chest x-ray and echocardiogram are also two of the reasonable differentials uh, that you probably would be getting uh, before having any nuclear imaging on the patient who's presenting with chest pain. 
Let's do some questions. Which of the following infections is classically associated with PAN? 1. Hepatitis A, 2. Hepatitis B, 3. Hepatitis C, 4. CMV, 5. EBV. And if you recall, uh, we have been mentioning about the classic association between hepatitis B and PAN. Therefore, the correct option in here is number 2. Question two, a 60 year old man present with left side of testicular pain. On examination, he is found to have levito reticularis on his legs. Blood results confirm an AKI of stage three, a CRP of 60 and ESR of 20 with negative ANA and ANCA. He proceeds to have an angiogram, uh, which is found to have rosary bead appearance. What is the likely diagnosis? 1. GPA, 2. EGPA, 3. Kawasaki disease, 4. PAN, 5. Berger's disease. So let's just go through this case. You have got a middle-aged man who's presenting with left-sided testicular pain. In the context of MRCP, left-sided testicular pain, you need to be thinking about a potential of vasculitis, particularly a case of PAN. You move on and you realize that he's got a classic rash on his skin, libido reticularis, which is frequently seen in cases of pan. The scenario tells you and confirms an AKI, raised inflammatory markers, and more importantly, negative ANA and ANCA. So it's basically excluding all of your uh, GPA and EGPA causes of vasculitis in here. However, what's giving you a classic textbook definition is the findings on the um, angiogram, which is the rosary bead, which is classically associated with the case of PAN. So let's do some questions. So the first question is, which of the following HLA subtypes is most closely associated with Becher's disease? So your options are HLA DR4, HLA B27, HLA B51, HLA DR2, and HLA B5801. So you'll remember from one of the previous slides that HLA B51 is the correct answer here. And this is just something that um, is worth knowing about, particularly for the MCQ portions of MRCP. Second question, a 30 year old Turkish lady presents to the rheumatology clinic with painful oral and genital ulcers of three months duration. Swabs with microbiology tests have been negative. She reports an acne foam rash since childhood treated with topical preparations. Over the last month, she has noted worsening joint pains. A pathogy testing clinic is positive. So given the likely diagnosis, which of the following treatments should be commenced? So if you were to see this particular vignette, in um, amongst all of the MCQ questions in your part one or part two exam, Bechet's syndrome should be quite high in your list, um, just given the age, ethnicity and all of these various um, clinical features she's presented with, as well as a positive pathogy test as well. In terms of treatment, so if we just go through them, the first option is methotrexate. Um, second is cyclophosphamide. There's low molecular weight heparin colchicine and roaccutane. So just working through these answers, methotrexate is not recommended in patients with Bechet's disease, so we can automatically disregard that. We think she's got Bechet's disease. Uh, we're pretty sure that she does. So roaccutane would not be the correct thing to give her in this situation, despite her history of acne, because we can see why she has that particular rash. It's because of it's part of the Bechet's disease. There's no indication to give low molecular weight heparin here or cyclophosphamide, actually, because she's not presented with any sort of thromboembolic phenomenon and her disease is not so severe that she requires um, massive levels of immunosuppression, as would be seen with cyclophosphamide. So the correct answer is the first line treatment for many patients, which is colchicine. Let's do some questions now. Uh, which of the following is involved in the pathogenesis of HSP? 1. IgE, 2. ANA, 3. IgA, 4. Rheumatoid factor, 5. ANCA. And if you recall, HSP, the exact etiology of it is not known. However, we do know that this is a type of small vessel vasculitis that is most likely um, due to IgA-related uh, disease. 
Question two. A seven-year-old girl uh, presents with one week history of worsening rash over her buttocks associated with bilateral knee and ankle pain. She has also noted some abdominal pain, which started approximately two weeks ago. Her parents report uh, she has been more irritable recently, but there isn't any complaint about headaches or fevers. On examination, you note a purpuric non-blanching rash over her buttocks and backs uh, of her thighs. There is no neck stiffness and she is apyrexial. The knee joints are both warm to touch and slightly swollen. Her GCS is 15. What is the most likely diagnosis? And the options that you get is one, Kawasaki disease, two, gastroenteritis, three, psoriatic arthritis, four, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, five, Henot Shenlon purpura or HSP. And if we go back to the case, you will realize that this is quite a classic explanation of um, HSP. You have got a young person who's presenting with a, a purpuric rash um, and bilateral joint pain and arthralgia. Vignette has also been kind enough to tell you that there isn't any neck stiffness, there isn't any fever to um, help you not to be thinking about a potential bacterial or um, meningitis case. And um, as you recall, this is going to be classically uh, associated with Henoshin Lund or HSP. So let's do some questions. Which of the following may be used for induction therapy in a patient with severe GPA? One, adalimumab. Two, rituximab. Three, atanacept. Four, tocilizumab. Five, azathioprine. And if you remember from the last um, slide that I just talked about, uh, you will um, recall that the uh, drugs that are going to be used for um, induction are going to be either a steroid with either rituximab um, or cyclophosphamide. And obviously, um, based on that, case two or option two in here is going to be the correct option. Question two. Which of the following is not a first line investigation in someone with suspected ankle associated vasculitis? One, blood pressure. Two, urine dip. Three, chest x ray. Four, CT angio. Five, ECG. And you don't necessarily need to have a very detailed knowledge of vasculitis to answer this question. You would just need to have a systematic practical approach when you're answering, uh, which is really key, especially in terms of your PACES exam when you're presenting your findings and, you would, you, and you're talking about how you want to manage uh, a certain condition. So any patient that comes in um, obviously will have their new chart um, taken and their basic observations. So by default, you're going to be having um, blood pressure as part of your panel. Then if you recall, we talked about the importance of having urine dipstick in cases of suspected vasculitis to exclude renal disease, uh, particularly looking for hematuria and proteinuria. So option two is not going to be uh, the correct option. Chest x-ray on the same um, line, you will remember that anyone who's presenting with pulmonary problem, uh, whether that's sh um, shortness of breath or chest pain, uh, you would want to be doing a basic chest x-ray to make sure that you're not missing something else basically. And ECG is going to be somebody who, again, as I said, who's presenting with shortness of breath and um, chest pain. It's not unreasonable to do an ECG to make sure that you're not dealing with the cardiac problem in here. So really the option that is not going to be as part of a first line investigation in someone with a suspected ankylosis vasculitis is going to be a CT angiogram. Make sure that you don't fall into the trap of thinking that anyone who has a suspected ankylosis vasculitis is immediately going to get a CT angiogram the first um, as the first point of call because that's clearly not how the practice works. So let's do some questions. Um, so the first question is, which of the following antibodies is associated with eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis? So our options are ANA, C ANCA, P ANCA, DSDNA or CCP antibodies. So 
really we, we know already that this is going to be an anchor associated vasculitis so it's a case of which one um, is the correct one and as you will remember from an earlier slide um, in this case it's p anchor you'll remember from the previous video that c anchor is associated with gpa or granulomatosis with polyangitis Second question, which of the following is not a classic clinical feature of a patient presenting with eGPA? Non-resolving adult onset asthma, glomerulonephritis, mononeuritis multiplex, pleural effusion, cutaneous granulomata. Now, with such a severe disease, um, that it can present in a whole myriad of ways. Um, so you may actually end up seeing all of these things at some point in a patient with eGPA, but the least likely one is a pleural effusion. The other four um, are classic signs of this condition. Let's do some questions now. So question one is which of the following antibodies is most closely associated with microscopic polyangitis? One is ANA, two is C anchor, three is P anchor, four is the SDNA and five is CCP. And if you recall correctly, you will remember that the correct option is going to be P anchor, which is positive in about 70% of cases with microscopic polyangitis. Question two is which of the following drugs may not be used in the treatment of MPA. One, infliximab, two, rituximab, three, cyclophosphamide, four, methylprednisolone, five, mycophenolate morphotil. And if you remember from our discussion earlier about the strategies for induction and remission of MPA, you will remember that infliximab doesn't have any role in it, whereas the others are either used for induction or maintenance treatment. Thanks for listening to this episode of Biosides MRCP. If you like what you've heard today, give us a thumbs up and hit the like and subscribe button below to make sure you don't miss our next episode. Let us know in the comments which topics you would like to hear in the future. See you in the next episode.